Okay, this is lecture 19. And if I have to uh, select the single most important lecture in entire semester, then I should say today's lecture. So today's lecture is so, so important. So let's go to the main contents. So importance of Shakata Gumme scheme. So today we will drive so-called Shapeta Gumme scheme. So um, this is a presentation by Professor Lundström in 2015 um, CISPED conference. So CISPED conference is uh, a famous or uh, well-known conference in the uh, computational microelectronics, actually the longest learning conference in this field. And you know that drift diffusion and computational electronics are still going strong after 40 years. And the equation that started it all here, there's the equation that started it, it means that the entire field of computational microelectronics. Of course, in this uh, presentation, so by Professor Armstrong, he said that drift diffusion equation. But I wanted to say that the drift diffusion equation without Shapatukumen scheme cannot hold, actually, cannot be applied to realistic uh, problems. So I think that the Shapatukumen scheme itself is at the center of our entire research field called computational microelectronics. So let's directly jump into this one. So uh, up to now, uh, in, uh, in, the, in our few last uh, lectures, we have tried to implement uh, drift diffusion solver. So I think that you have all succeeded uh, to implement the drift diffusion solver. You calculate the terminal current and it works. That is good thing. However, today I wanted to say that if we just naively apply our previous scheme to the realistic problem, that will introduce a severe numerical problem in realistic case. So think about this one. What was our naive approach? At the time, our JN in one dimensional structure should be written as this way dy over dx and plus q dn dn over dx. This is the expression for the electron current density. And yes, we have this expression. And if we discretize the form of this J sub n between x i and x i plus 1, we will define our J n at a median point, like i plus just half. In this case, our approximated form for this J sub n was q mu n and at the time oh we had made a certain approximation like just taking the average of our electron density and multiply this lin also linearly approximated d phi over dx phi i plus 1 minus phi i divided by delta x. That was the discretization of our first term and also q d n and n i plus 1 minus n i divided by delta x. That was our previous discretization. So do you remember it? So at the time, I already made a warning about this scheme. 
So we have made a linear approximation to every variable, including electron density and electrostatic potential. But, you know, electron density varies quite dramatically over the real space that will make some problems in our situation. Okay, so that's the point. Actually, we have the variation we have a variation of electron density and we have a variation of electrostatic potential along the real space. And of course, we can apply linear approximation to these two variables and when both of them um, um, changes smoothly along the real space position, then this um, linear approximation will be quite good and perfectly well suited for these cases. But in most cases, yes, electrostatic potential. This is potential and it varies linearly from certain maximum value, from the minimum value to the maximum value smoothly. So this is suitable for applying the linear approximation between these two neighboring nodes. However, N is not linearly changing. Think about this one specific case. Let's say that we are working a system at equilibrium. N our potential is just given by this form, linearly varying. Mm -hmm. So in this case, phi, the linear approximation to phi will be perfect. However, what will happen to our electron density? Let's say that here, one certain point, we have phi equal to zero. And in the just neighboring point, we have potential just to one millivolt. Mm. In this case, what will happen to the system at equilibrium? If you remember correctly, then electron density is simply given by intrinsic carrier density exponential phi over vt. So in this case, in this node, you will have just intrinsic carrier density and here you will have intrinsic carrier density exponential 1 millivolt over vt. Hmm. So therefore you can easily understand if we change it instead of this 1 millivolt if we go to 10 millivolt or 100 millivolt, the values of electron density at this right node will be um, an intrinsic carrier density times exponential 10, 10 millivolt over thermal voltage or 100 millivolt over thermal voltage. You know that in this case, if we draw this electron density as a function of position. Then let's say that this is intrinsic carrier density and this is the one intrinsic carrier density multiplied by exponential delta phi over vt. Here delta phi means that the potential difference between these two nodes. Then if we have a really small uh, phi, mm. so since this is just the exponential function, so um, we have to draw in this way. Mm -hmm. If we go to even larger difference, 
larger difference in the electrostatic potential, then we will have this variation. If we go to even higher values, then we will have this variation. So certainly this, this, and this, these functions are not linear. So taking just a linear approximation over this highly non-linear function will make a failure. That is the reason of failure in our naive approximation or naive approach. Now you understand there is something wrong or something weak in this approximation. But let's just have a look at more in a more detailed way. So this was the equation we have introduced. So you can easily understand here we have average of electron density and linearly approximated electrostatic potential and here also linearly approximated electron density. So you can easily understand since n is a highly nonlinear function over the position that gives you quite bad result also this one will give you quite bad result for you. Mm. I think that this is okay. It's okay. But for electron terms, then that will, that means that uh, the linear approximation will give you quite bad result. So after simple manipulation, here simple manipulation means that just to multiply delta x to the left hand side, right hand side. So this one goes to here and divide it by summer voltage. Then this mu n, mu n multiplied by summer voltage now become just to give them coefficient. You can easily understand this manipulation. So of course we have adopted the, the Eisenheim relation, so that's the reason why we can easily convert this mu n to dn. So, anyway, there is nothing significant this, between this and that. This is just a change of the way of a presentation. And let's just combine those terms in terms of n defined at x sub i plus 1 and ni, the electron density defined at x sub i position. So just to collect the terms related with these two, so for example, for i and i plus 1, we will have a coefficient like this, and of course we have the terms like this. So we have number one come from here and other terms come from here. So this is related with diffusion term and this one is related with drift term. The first term is related with drift term and second term is related with diffusion term. So here we have combined term related with diffusion and drift. Also, when we collect the coefficient for n sub i, then also you can find that there is a terms come from this diffusion term, also come from this thing. So you have this one. So we have the term come from drift term. So it is quite understandable because J contains both of drift and diffusion contributions and these two, two contributions will appear in a coefficient of n sub i plus 1 and n sub i. Then let's go to the Schapetter gumel scheme. So then this is still just 
manipulated form of our naive approach. And I wanted to ask you this simple and important question. What happens if the potential difference between two nodes, so phi i sub 1, i plus 1, means that potential defined at x sub i plus 1 minus phi i means that phi defined at x sub i. If the potential difference of two neighboring points is larger than 2 times vt, then what will happen? If this one is larger than 2 times vt, then, for example, phi i plus 1 minus phi i divided by 2 times vt should be larger than 1. Since here, here we have the term without absolute value, so it can be either larger than 1 or smaller than minus 1. Also, this one can be larger than 1 or smaller than minus 1. Then what will happen? Think about the situation where it is larger than 1. Then the first coefficient here becomes negative. Of course, in this case, this second coefficient will be larger than number 2. But this positive number doesn't matter. The point is, here, in this case, we will have negative coefficient for n sub i plus 1. And even when we consider the opposite case, like this term, smaller than minus 1, then this minus 1 term will give you the overall coefficient larger than 2. That doesn't matter. Large number, large positive number doesn't matter. It's okay. However, if we have the term smaller than minus 1, then eventually now this second term becomes a negative number. So, simply speaking, if we have a condition of this, so, condition of this, in other words, if the potential difference So, if the potential difference between two neighboring nodes becomes too large, then I want to say one of two coefficients for the electron densities. I mean that the coefficient for n sub i plus 1 or n sub i becomes negative. That's the point. Mm -hmm. Here, for example, think about this one. If you have just a diffusion term, then how does it look like? If you have just a diffusion term, then maybe you will try to approximate it in a way like this qdn and ni plus 1 minus ni divided by delta x so then i wanted to ask you what is the coefficient for your variables in this case you will say that the coefficient for n sub i plus 1 will be 
q times q dn over delta x. That is certainly a positive number. And when you consider the coefficient for n sub i, then you will have minus q dn over delta x. Okay. In this case, when I say the coefficient here, I'm now currently saying that the coefficient for n sub i plus 1 and minus n sub i. Then think about this one. In the case of a diffusion only case, you will have a positive number. Certainly that is a positive number. And for coefficient for n sub i, you will have a still positive q d n over delta x. That is also a positive number. Certainly, you have in both terms for n sub i plus 1 and n sub i minus n sub i, you have both positive terms when you consider diffusion. However, now you have different numbers for this naively discretized form. Okay? Then maybe some of you can ask me that question or that issue. Okay? So that's the reason why we have a positive or sometimes a negative terms for n sub i plus 1 or minus n i is because we have introduced drift. So you have just considered the case of a diffusion only situation. So that at that time, two positive coefficients are quite natural. However, if we consider drift term, then that can change. It. Maybe that is your argument for justifying your previous discretization, but certainly it's not the truth. For example, think about this one. Now here we have a certain position, and here now we have a certain position, and we are now considering the flux between here. This position is denoted as x sub i, and the neighboring position is denoted as x sub i plus 1. So in the case of diffusion, what will happen? If you have more electrons and smaller electrons, then what will happen to this guy? If you have larger electrons, and if your electrons move this direction, okay, that will contribute to the flux, positive flux. And if you have smaller electron density, and yes, that will give you smaller flux. Anyhow, both of them contribute. So, in this case, we, it is quite easily understandable. But the case is, in the case of, uh, <clears throat> in the case of, you know, drift, the direction of electron motion is not predefined. If you have strong force term like this, think about this one. This is the direction for your the, the direction of force exerted on your electrons. Then your electrons all move this direction. Mm -hmm. Then what will happen to the coefficient for n sub i? When we had diffusion only, then the direction was this. Mm. But if we have a strong electric field or strong electronic force which push our electrons to the left side, then of course there will be certain flux due to drift term. So overall effect of this diffusion and 
script will give you the reduced amount of coefficient for your this an item mm -hmm. that is quite understandable but that is still positive so think about this one if you increase your field further 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 then what will happen so you may think that okay if we apply two large electric field then eventually there will be just inversion of coefficient and all of our electrons are just moving toward just the left side therefore the negative sign is quite acceptable but please note that oh, even in the case when all of your electrons are moving toward left direction but the contribution to your flux at this position should be zero instead of negative i mean that yes we have electrons and they are moving this direction then how many electrons are crossing this position our measuring position of course in this case no electrons passing through this position is related with this x sub i position the electrons occupying this position is already passed from the right position and they will just move toward left side so nothing related with the flux at this position however in our naive approach we don't care about it so if we just apply our approach to this system then that will give you negative sign to yield on physical system up to now i have thought about the coefficient actually the sign of coefficient so when we think about the coefficient of n i plus 1 n minus n i both coefficient should be positive to have physically uh, sound system however now we can find that if we apply our naively discretized scheme then when we have a large potential difference across two neighboring position that phase so that phase to yield all positive coefficient for our unknown variables electron densities that introduce big trouble in our discretization So now we have two points, so which is represented by position x sub i and position x sub i plus one, and there are certain number of electrons. That number is n sub i plus one, and Oh, sorry, I made a mistake here. And i and n i plus one. And we are now counting the number crossing this position. So, so if we our electrons here, here we have one electrons and moves in this direction, it contribute to our flux or Jn because you know Jn is just minus q times Fn so they can be regarded as the same quantity so if we have electrons and move toward right side 
in this part, in, in, this, in this part, then that will contribute. However, if we have electrons moving toward this left side, then what will happen to our F sub n or J sub n? This electron does not contribute to anything to the flux at this position. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the contribution from this position, the electron density at x sub i should be at least non-negative. Okay, if there occurs some, there come at every second, if one electron is coming, mm -hmm, then we we'll say that one electron per second. If we have 10 electrons coming from left side, then we we'll say 10 electrons per second. If we have more, 1,000, 1 million, then we can say so. However, we cannot say minus 1 electron per second is passing through this position. That is not physical. That is quite unphysical description. It is just counting the number of electrons passing through certain position. So at the worst case, we can have zero electron is passing through this position in last a few minutes. It is possible. However, oh, there was a minus 100 electrons passing through this position. That is not possible. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why we have to have positive coefficient. If you have negative coefficient, that is closely related with long physical description. Okay? So that was my explanation about the positivity or negativity of your coefficient. So that is unphysical. And let's think about another uh, viewpoint. Think about J n, which is i plus 1. It has coefficient like n i, and it has a certain number. And here you have minus n i plus 1 and n i you have a certain coefficient. Also, you can have i, oh, sorry about that, I made mistakes here, and minus half. In this case, you have a n i and certain coefficient minus n i minus 1 and certain coefficient. We can think about this kind of a discretized form. Then, Let's try to implement our continuity equation. How does it look like? So at a steady state, then we can say that should be zero. And if we integrate it over the control volume of our x sub i position, then eventually we have Jn defined at i plus half position minus Jn i minus half position should be 0. Mm -hmm. You can understand it. Then let's say that A, B, C, D. And my suggestion is all of A, B, C, and D are non-zero quantity because that is physical description about this system. Then if we have this condition, then think about this. 
if we just insert our discretized form into discretized continuity equation, then what will happen to our cases? In this case, we will have n i plus 1 and its coefficient is a and minus n i its coefficient becomes b plus c and now finally we have n i its coefficient is d d 0 so let me just write down the empty parenthesis like a b plus c and you know this one is d the reason why i'm talking about this is now since we are making the discretization for x i position this n i this one takes the center node and this one is corresponding to the right node and left node in a sense they are neighboring nodes and let's just count the overall sign for the center node and neighboring nodes then how about this center node in the case of center node you have strong minus coefficient and for neighboring nodes you have positive coefficient and positive coefficient mm -hmm. so maybe you remember our discussion about Poisson equation or when we discretize the Laplace equation or Poisson equation we had certain Jacobian system where the center node or the one for center node or corresponding to the diagonal component has a distinct sign all of the up diagonal components have certain sign for example positive then the diagonal component has the, the opposite sign negative that was quite important to have the stability of our system and exactly same manner you can find this sign relation so diagonal component has the opposite sign with all other op diagonal components so that is quite a good indicator for the stability of our mm, discretized system but think about this one if you have, for example, negative b values, mm. then what will happen? Then now, this sum of b and c is no longer guaranteed to uh, have negative sign. If your b is quite a large negative number in, in absolute sense, then now it can flip the sign of your overall term. Now it can become, for example, positive. Then what will happen? Every term in this uh, uh, discretized coefficient becomes positive. So there is, there is no different sign or no opposite sign for diagonal component. That is really, really bad situation for the discretized system. That will ruin, actually, your system. So maybe you can ask me further question. Oh, professor, now I understand if we have non-positivity for our coefficient for n i plus 1 or minus n i if this and that are not positive this is not when this condition is not hold then we can have um, we can lose 
the different sign property of diagonal components. I can understand, but how does it matter to our stability? Why do you care about the sign of diagonal term too much? That is quite much related with physical description of our quantity, unknown variable. Think about what is your unknown variable. So, in this case, what is it? Our unknown variable was n i plus 1, n i, n i minus 1, blah, blah, blah. And they are all electron densities. And you know, since this one is density, you have strong physical constraint on it. What is it? Electron density is a non-negative quantity. So you cannot have minus electron density that is unphysical. However, if you lose the diagonal different sign property of your diagonal component, then there is no guarantee that you still have positive electron density in everywhere in your system. So think about this one. You solve your system and you get certain number and certain number just reveals that at a certain position you have a negative electron density and you have to make a presentation at the conference. You bring your solution and show it to, to your colleagues. Then what will happen? That cannot be justified because that is not a physical behavior that strongly means that your discretization has something wrong inside it. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why your previous naive approach cannot be justified. We have to invent a better scheme where in most cases still we have positive electron density. So up to now, I have discussed about the one single important observation. When we discretize our electron uh, current density, then it will have an i plus 1 and minus an i. So here we will have certain coefficient for them. So whether this one really becomes positive or, or negative, that doesn't make matter because uh, sometimes we can omit negative sign or something like that. But point is, if these two have the opposite sign, sign, then that means there is something wrong we have to have all positive signs for n sub i plus 1 and minus n sub i. So that is simple thing we have to understand. Mm -hmm. That is, if we have such a case, that is really unphysical and also when we actually apply it to numerical solution, then it is very easy to have negative electron density. Also, that is quite unacceptable to us. So that's the reason why we wanted to avoid it. Okay, that, that was a long story, but the main message is quite simple. Okay. I hope that you are now fully motivated about a new scheme to discretize 
your electron current density. Aha, we need a scheme where coefficient for n sub i plus 1 and minus n sub i should be always positive or always negative. So share the sign. That is the point. So today, from now on, with using our remaining 20 minutes, I will introduce the Schapeter Gummel scheme to you. Let's go. <clears throat> so let's start from our one dimensional system. So please note that Schapeter Gummel scheme is just applied to one dimensional system. And after that, we will just uh, use it to multi-dimensional system without modification. So J sub n, when we write down, then it is given by Q mu n n and d phi over d x mm -hmm, n plus Q d n d n over d x. Mm, you know it. And in this case, we will treat this expression as a differential equation for n. That is main invention. So, uh, previously, we tried to just uh, discretize it with a certain assumption, linear assumption. However, from now on, we will say, okay, this n can be highly nonlinear function. So, therefore, we will try to solve the n as a function of a certain quantities okay so here we have to introduce many uh, 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 very important assumption we will say jn is a constant that is the point you know that this one can be a function of a position. Of course, electron density can be a function of a position. Yes, they can. They can be and they are functions of a position. However, the result of that manipulation always introduce a constant. How can we say so? Since this is just one dimensional system, so there is, there is no way for our current density change. If we don't have this constantness over small uh, interval, then we don't have any electron continuity. So please note that we have to solve d j d j n over d x should be zero. It simply means that j n equal to a constant. Of course, if we have nearly two dimensional systems, so then we can have change of j n in its directional component. However, since we are talking about very short interval and one dimensional flux then we can say j sub n is a constant so that is quite a big advancement then now please have a look at then combining these two conditions so treat it as a treat it as a differential equation and this one becomes a constant. Then what will happen? 
then let me just write down you know, more arranged form just divide the left hand side and right hand side by q times dn and you can find that easily q is gone and um, un divided by dn becomes just 1 over vt and now you have d phi over dx and n equal to jn divided by q times dn now you have this form ah oh, so this is first of a derivative of n and this is the the linear term for n now this one becomes a constant because from the physical uh, argument we just treated it in this that j sub n as a constant now this entire right hand side term becomes a constant okay now we have first order differential equation and we have a coefficient for our linear term and here in principle actually although 1 over vt is a constant this one this one in principle can be a function of position here however you know that from our former discussion uh, the, the most important thing we have to care is electron density the electrostatic potential really smoothly bearing over the position so instead of taking this derivative term we will just it write down in this way mm -hmm. minus 1 over vt and delta phi divided by delta x I just made an approximation linear approximation for our electrostatic potential so maybe you can ask me this question up to now you try to kick out linear approximation most however why do you introduce linear approximation again so whoa I wanted to kick out the linear approximation for electron density yes I agree however in the case of uh, electrostatic potential I will just keep the linear approximation mm -hmm. and here by definition this delta phi is given by phi i plus 1 minus phi i the potential difference between neighboring positions so now by applying the linear approximation for the electrostatic potential now we have surprisingly simple situation oh that is really beautiful so now it becomes just first order derivative equation for electron density and it has constant coefficient and constant inhomogeneous term from this differential equation it is really straightforward find out the homogeneous solution the homogeneous solution should be given by 1 over vt and delta phi over delta x just coefficient here and x that will be the homogeneous solution this is homogeneous solution homogeneous solution and we have to a uh, particular solution generated by this one but let's say that the term the constant term 
generated by this constant inhomogeneous term as just B. Hmm. How about this? And of course, we have an undetermined coefficient for this homogeneous term. Let's call it as capital A and capital B, whatever. So that is hmm, our starting point. Then our remaining task is to determine A and B. And from this A and B information, we can express our, eventually, our Jn as a function of certain quantities. That is the point. So let's think about this one. Let's just apply the boundary conditions. For example, when we have x i plus 1, then we have to have n sub i plus 1. Mm -hmm. And when we insert x, x sub i, then we have to n sub i. Let's just do it together with me. When we insert i plus 1 as an index for real space position, then a becomes uh, a 1 over bt delta phi over delta x. And here we have x i plus 1 and plus b. And when we insert x sub i, then we will have an i equal to exponential oh bt delta phi delta x x i plus b then what will happen to this one from these two in equations and you know that this and that are treated as a given number so we can try to find out the expression. So why don't you why don't you just to calculate the difference, the difference between n uh, i plus one minus n i now becomes this b term is gone and a and exponential one over v t and delta x del, uh, delta phi over delta x and x i and exponential 1 over v t delta phi delta x and here we have delta uh, x i plus 1 minus x i and minus 1. Okay. Is it because, you know, this x i plus 1 can be written as x i plus x i plus 1 minus x i. So that's the reason why we can decompose it and just to take the common factors and the terms related with position difference. Okay, so now we can say a exponential v t delta phi delta x x i times n exponential. I just write down the gain delta phi delta x and let's call it as delta x. So here we have a delta x and, and delta x and they are gone. Now delta phi. Oh, that is great simplification. Okay. Okay. So now we understand mm, this uh, <coughs> this a times some certain term here now becomes 
a times exponential v p delta phi delta x x i term now becomes what and i plus 1 minus n i divided by exponential delta phi over v t minus 1 wow okay mm -hmm. then now we can apply once again our simple uh, specification for example let's just consider an i then this is an i x i mm -hmm. so we have certain expression for b now b equal to n i minus this term. Mm -hmm. And you can easily understand this coefficient is actually this coefficient. Uh -huh. So instead of it, I will just write down here my own new expression. Okay. I will just write down well, exponential delta phi over vt minus 1 and i plus 1 minus ni. Aha! So I think that the time is up, so we have to stop here. But I think that I have already covered most important part. So at the beginning of our lecture today, I have spent time to give you the motivation why we have to invent another way to discretize the electron continuity equation or the electron current density itself. So that was the sign of a coefficient. We have to care about the sign. If the sign is uh, uh, long, then that will give you unphysical description over the system. That was one thing. After that, we treated our current density expression as a differential equation of electron density. After that, we introduced many approximations, for example, one-dimensional system approximation and constantness of our current density, but I see that that is really a perfect approximation. And we have also introduced um, the linear approximation for electrostatic potential, but that is still okay because we will treat it as a linear function. After that, when we just solve it, then we can find that our B term can be expressed as this term. So the remaining task will be just to use this B to yield J sub N. However, I will just to do it in the next time. So next time, we will start from quickly review our previous lecture, actually this lecture, lecture 19, and will give you the answer or the final form of our J sub n. So I wanted to ask you if you, uh, you guys come to your position and just to do your exercise to derive it. So of course in lecture 20, I will show it in a detailed manner, but I think that it's much better for you derive it by yourself. So please do so. This content is the single most important content in our entire semester. So although that sounds uh, weird, but please believe in me and you have to master the derivation of this procedure and fully understand the main motivation for 
driving this new scheme, Chapter Gunman Scheme. Okay, thank you and see you on Wednesday. Bye.